there, welcome. My name is Holly Mecker from Instructional Tech. I'm so glad that you're here with us today to learn about student portfolios and learning journals, really taking time to help students deeply process their learning. Um, this is just gonna be a quick video. We're gonna talk about what and why our student portfolios and then see some examples in practice, both in Google Slides and then also in Seesaw. When I was in the classroom, I struggled to have students truly reflect on their learning. I understood the importance of reflection. I needed a strong, unbreakable system, one that was easy, convenient, and didn't take up a lot of my time, because that's the problem, right? Time is always the barrier. And I think student portfolios are the answer. So when we talk about student portfolios or learning journals, what we're talking about is a place for students to store some of their work, maybe work they're proud of, or lessons they learned a lot from. And we also want a place for students to reflect on that learning because while we want students to showcase their work, even more we want to showcase the student thought and reflection behind the work. So when we use student portfolios or learning journals, we help students meaningfully reflect on their own learning to help promote growth. We also allow students to make connections and really deeply process their own learning. We want to help our students move from being consumers of information to creators of material, giving their work purpose and giving their work a stage. So it is well known that reflection is a crucial part of the learning process, but that doesn't mean it always comes naturally for students or teachers. So let's dive into it a little bit. So reflection honestly simply means to think again about something that's happened. So when we ask our students to reflect on their learning, we're just asking them to recall what it was like to respond to an activity. How did you feel while working? What did you find most successful? Research shown that when the brain experiences something, it doesn't necessarily see it accurately. So your perspective, your mindset, um, your background knowledge, maybe your emotional well-being at the time, all of those things affect how you experience something, even when you experience a learning task. So consider watching a movie for the first time. You don't know what's going to happen, and so your brain kind of experiences the story with anticipation, and you're trying to make patterns. You're trying to relate to the characters while you're following what might happen. You watch the movie for a second time, and you'll see it completely differently. How many times do we rewatch a show and we're like, wow, I didn't even notice that the first time, the second time, the third time? I'm on my fourth time through Game of Thrones and I'm still seeing new things every time I watch it. It's because my brain is experiencing it different every single time. So that's what we're asking our students to do, to go back and to experience the activity again. Okay, and while there's learning and reflection that can happen during all parts of this process, the learning journal really focuses on the student after learning. What kind of reflection can they do after the activity is finished? All right, so let's go ahead and jump in and see what one example of a learning journal might look like, this one taking place in Google Slides. All right, so here we are inside of my first example. This is a Google Slides learning journal. It's a great place for students to be able to add work. Um, it is able to be shared home to anyone, maybe a parent or family member might wanna see some of their learning. You could share that home. And it's also collaborative between you and the student because it is a, a Google item. So you could easily be a collaborator on this, so you could give them feedback, leave them comments, things like that. Um, so let's just walk through first what it looks like for a student when they haven't added any of their own pages. So just like you can see here, there's a title page, so I'll just change their name here. Um, so maybe Julian's Learning Journal. And then there's a slide for them to introduce themselves. They're gonna delete this text box and add some information about themselves. They could replace this rocket ship with maybe a picture of themselves if they wanted to just a way to maybe take ownership over this journal a little bit. The next three slides here, slide three, four, and five, are reflection questions. A lot of times students need help with what to reflect on. They're like, I don't know how just to reflect, right? That's not enough for a student. So we have reflection questions for finished work. So if they're done with their work, what could they reflect on? Maybe what surprised you about what you learned? Are you proud of this work? Things like that, different type of questions for students to answer based off their work that they've completed. There's also reflection questions for goal setting. Um, these last three are my favorite. I would ask my students to answer these questions every week. What is your academic goal this week? What is your behavioral goal this week? And what is your social goal this week? Um, so they can try to set some goals as well. 
And then the last one is for relationship building. How are they interacting with their peers? What are you doing that might be bothering your classmates? What are classmates doing that might be inhibiting you from learning? Um, things like that to really get students thinking about how they're building relationships within their classroom. Okay, and then there's a last page that has just a um, little editable icon that students can use and um, throughout their notebook. Okay, so those are the, the six slides that come already put into their journal. Now, because this um, learning journal was created in Google Slides with master slides, when students go to add a slide, they have these options here that are already ready for their work. So let's imagine a student did something on the iPad. Um, they created a video, or maybe they took a picture of their work on, or a screenshot of their work on their iPad that they're really proud of. They could come in to add a slide, and if it's digital work, they could grab one of these iPad pages. There's an iPad on dotted paper, on grid paper, and on lined paper. So maybe they add this, and they put their screenshot of their work here. They add a title, maybe the assignment title, and then they respond to one of those reflection questions that you ask them to respond to. Then there's always a place there for the date. Maybe a student does work on paper, right? Most of us are back in the classroom. We have students doing things on paper, creating at their desk. And so now students can also add in a blank sheet of paper, maybe just a blank white sheet of paper they want to add in. Okay, and then they're going to submit a picture. They're going to take a picture with their iPad and put that work here and tell us why they're proud of that work, what they've learned from that work, what was challenging about that work. Okay, so they're able to continuously build this notebook because these template slides don't go anywhere. They're always here for students um, to use and use and use again because they're created within the master slides. Um, so as a teacher, these are also editable to you. So if there was um, one of these slides that you wanted to change a little bit, like I always have the date. Maybe you're like, I don't want the date on there. You can always go in and edit that um, just by going to view and going to master. And within these master slides, you can make changes. So if I didn't want the date on this one, I could just delete that text box, delete this text box, and it would be gone off those options for students. Okay, if you want to learn more about master slides, we have a whole different PD video on our YouTube channel just for using master slides. So if you want more information about that, make sure you look that up when you have a chance. So this is an excellent way for students to be able to continuously add to this journal um, because those slides are always available to them. The next example I want to show you brings you back into Seesaw. Now, I know a lot of us have become Seesaw professionals since March of 2020. However, Seesaw was originally created as a portfolio place for students, a place for students to showcase their work, a way to make connections between home and school so parents can see the great work that's happening in our classrooms. What happened when March hit is it became almost like a learning management system for us. It's where everything went. Right? We put every lesson, every assignment, everything we created went onto Seesaw. So now that that is not always what needs to happen, it's a great time to dial back and decide when is the right time to use Seesaw. Okay, When is the right time to showcase student work, to have students create great digital work that we want to share home, or even showcase the paper copy work that we're doing um, to share with parents to show them the great work we're doing. So we're going to jump into Seesaw and look at what it might look like to more use Seesaw the way it was created and not the way we had to bend it to work for us when the pandemic hit. All right, so here I am in Seesaw. Um, the first thing we're going to want to do is create a space in Seesaw that is separate from their other learning that they're doing digitally. We want a space that was just going to be their learning journal. Okay, so what I've created is a class simply called Learning Journal. Now you can simply take one of the courses you already have and rename it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'll rename this class again just so you can see what that process looks like. So I'm in the class that I want to rename and I'm going to push the wrench here in the corner for the settings. In the class settings, we're going to do a, a few things to make sure this is ready to be our portfolio learning journal space. And the first thing we're going to do is rename the class. So the first option that comes up is your class name. And this is where I could rename it. I just simply tap it, type in the name that I'd like, and go back. And now my class has changed. Um, 
the class icon. Once you are, once that's loaded, you can put it in there, class icon, if you'd like. Um, otherwise, it will be those initials of your class. Um, and the other thing we want to make sure we do that we're going to talk about a little bit later, but we want to make sure the student blog is turned on. So I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to have the blog enabled. So mine's green, which means it's turned on. And I also want to turn on that students can post to the blog. We'll talk about the blog and the settings a little bit later, but it's nice to already have that set up. Okay, so let's go ahead and head back out of our settings. So now we have a class that is only for their learning journal or their portfolio, okay? This is where students are going to share either work that they're proud of, something that they want to send home so their parents can see it, they want to submit it to you so that you can see that they're proud of their work, and they want to have it for themselves so they can have a space to um, look at all the work that they are proud of, okay? So this is our separate class. Now we have to talk about how we want to get this work that they're proud of into their learning journal. So my recommendation for you is to always have one activity going through this class um, where students can submit to their journal. So I'm gonna to head to my activities and you can see I have an activity assigned to my class called Showcase Assignment. My students, anytime they wanna to post to their portfolio learning journal, they're going to submit something to this assignment. Okay, let's go ahead and open that up and see what that looks like. Here I am in my Showcase Assignment. Let's take a look at the template and see what that looks like for students. So we know that when students are going to respond and put something in their learning journal, we want to see the work that they're doing, and we also want to see their thoughts, what they're thinking and reflecting on about their work. Okay, so in this template, I have a place where students are going to insert a picture of their work, okay, whether it's a screenshot or an actual picture of something they've done physically, and then some prompts here, just to get them thinking about how to reflect on this. Now remember, in Seesaw, this can be a video, this could be written words, or this could be audio. Okay, so reaching all of your learners and allowing all of their voices to be heard by picking whatever modality works best for them. I know that my students greatly benefited from having sentence starters, so I have sentence starters there ready for them. So again, a student can submit as many responses to their assignment as they would like. So I already have this sample student has already submitted two. Um, the first one they submitted is a screenshot of a Seesaw activity that they've done. They submit this, they're very proud of the Seesaw post that they have, and then maybe they would reflect with these questions. And then the second one they did is two days later, they have something really proud of one of their science assignments. Okay, so now if I were to back out of this assignment and go into their personal journal, right? Every student has a journal in every class. By going just to their journal, I'm able to see all the items that they are most proud of, okay? If you have parents connected to this class, this could be your most powerful class to have parents connected to, right? It's all the work that students are proud of, and then also their reflections, right? Parents can see maybe where students are struggling. Sometimes the work that we're proud of isn't because we got 100% on it. Maybe it's because it was really challenging. It was something we were they were struggling with and they had to work really hard to really finish that assignment. Maybe that's a reason why they're proud. Hey, okay, what a great piece of evidence for parents to see of the learning that's happening in your classroom. So again, here's the student. I can scroll down and see everything that they're proud of as a consistent look because they have this template that they're filling out each time. So the journal looks very consistent. Okay, so that's the first most important thing is that we have a separate space for their journal, okay? And then somehow they need to have a way to submit items to their journal. They could easily just add student work, right? They could just post into the journal if they wanted to. But by having this activity, we have that consistent look and we're always getting reflections from students because that's prompted for them, okay? The second thing that I think is, could be really powerful about using Seesaw, the way it was intended, is now we can have students interacting with one another on work that they're proud of, okay? We, in, as a district, we do not have the um, feature turned on where students can look at other, each other's work and comment on it, right? We've asked you to have that turned off for privacy reasons because this is all the student work that they've done, that entire quarantine section from March until now, all their work was on Seesaw. And so we want that to be private between between teacher and student. But with the Seesaw blog, 
I'm able to have students interacting with other student work that they're proud of. Okay, so here I am inside of an assignment. Um, this is a student's activity. As a teacher, now that my blog is activated, I have a globe down here at the bottom. If this is something I am really proud of this student, what a great piece of evidence that I want to share with the class. I could push that globe, and now it's going to prompt me and ask me, do I want to publish this to the blog? I do, and now it's going to be published in the blog. Let's go back into our settings, and so we can see what exactly that means for our students in the blog. All right, here I am back on my homepage. The blog is right over here to the right, um, so I'm going to go ahead and choose the blog. Okay, so this is what it looks like so far. I just added this activity. I'm going to go back into my settings just so we can make sure everything is set up correctly. So I want my students to be able to post the blog. Um, and I also want my students to be able to comment on the blog. Okay, I want them to comment on each other's work. They're all proud of their work. I want other students to tell them they're also proud of their work. Okay, um, all comments, even if this is... So because this is turned on, all students will be able to comment. However, it will still come to you for approval. No comments will go out on the blog without you approving those comments first. Okay? You can also password protect your blog. So if you wanted to put a password on your blog, this would allow you to share that password with parents or families. So parents and families can see our class blog. You could share that password with other classrooms within the school you wanted to build a school community and comment on each other's blogs. You could share that blog password with maybe another classroom across the country and you guys want to work together and collaborate on your blogs together. Okay, that password allows you to only allow certain people into your blog. Let's head back out. So I mentioned as a teacher, I now can post to the student blog, right? I can assign this post into the blog. Generally, I wouldn't want my students to take ownership over those actions. I want them to be like, yes, I am so proud of this that I want to share it with my classmates. I want them to see the good work I've done. I want them to see that I'm thinking about my thinking. I'm reflecting on my learning. Okay, they also have this globe option here where they can then post to their blog as well from their journal. So if they're within their journal, they can push the blog button. That will also be pushed right into our class blog so all of our classmates can see and respond to each other's work, okay? What a powerful way to take the work that they are proud of, right, and make that something the class can reflect on together. We can talk about items in the class blog. We can comment on those items in the class blog um, and really make a collaborative space for us to be sharing our, our showcased work and the work that we're proud of. So there it is, folks. I hope um, you feel empowered to think about ways that you can include uh, portfolios into your elementary classroom next school year. Um, I think they are such a great way to show kids that we are proud of the work they're doing and to encourage them to continue to reflect on their learning after the assignment is finished. Um, if you are someone who's interested in doing um, student-led conferences, this is a way to showcase student work and a way for uh, your students to know what they're going to be showing their parents, right? They're already used to reflecting and now they're just going to reflect with their parents. They're going to talk to their parents about the amazing work that they're doing throughout the school year. So um, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Make sure to drop them down below. Uh, ECS teachers, make sure you fill out our feedback form linked um, below as well. Um, and I also have the links to Seesaw assignments and to the uh, Google Slides portfolio if you would like to use that. So uh, thank you for joining us and have a great day.